Thank you for having me. Uh, this topic is going to be somewhat um, dry, but I'll try to make it interesting. A number of years ago, when I was first starting in security, I had the feeling that there was something wrong. There was, there was, there was a problem with the whole idea of that we needed computer security. Because really what computers are for is not solving security problems. We expect computers to do something useful, like play games or uh, have databases, but yet we keep having computer security problems. We are essentially a drag on all the things that people want to do with computers. And ever since I had that realization, computer security as a problem has bothered me and has made me uncomfortable. But I started off with this idea that we can do it, we can fix things, we can put firewalls in place, and then um, I remember in the early 90s, uh, Paul Robertson and I on the firewalls mailing list were hypothesizing that somebody would invent firewall breakers, a thing that would go behind your firewall and make a hole out, and that everybody was going to need to have their firewalls configured to stop traffic going out as well as traffic going in. And as you can imagine, that never really quite worked. Um, and it probably never will really quite work. But in the meantime, we're going to have computer security as a problem. And, and now, when you look at what's happening with IoT, I went through a period where I was very depressed by the cloud. You could see I was kind of you know, down in the dumps. I thought we were going to be doomed by the cloud. And then I realized the cloud isn't bad. For people who don't know how to do computing, cloud is a great thing. If you know how to do computing, then you have a choice of whether or not to do things in the cloud or whether or not to do things on-prem. But if you really don't know how to do computing you, or systems administration, you can move things out to the cloud. And that, is when, that was when I started to look at things a little bit more closely, and I started to realize that the problem was not really computer security. It was systems administration, and I'll get to that. Um, okay, pushing a button here. Okay, so I'm at the point where now I'm saying I told you so a lot. I've been doing this for, for much too long, and I'm at the point where people who have did things that I advised them not to do are now beginning to reap the rewards for, for doing those things that I advised them not to do. And I get to charge them double to come in and do incident response and try to fix up, fix up their problems after it's too late, which is very nice, but it, it's kind of frustrating as well. Okay, I'm, I'm having trouble with this. All right, so here's what's going on. The current trends that are pushing computer security around are that management wants to do more with less, which is a perfectly reasonable thing. They want business leverage. They want to be able to get, uh, they want to be able to get productivity gains out of systems. Um, they, the, the premise that comes with that is let's do process, not people. Instead of hiring people, we're going to hire, we're going to, we're going to bring in technology, or we're going to use someone else's people. We're going to outsource things. Um, the idea of having an in-house security team has come under a great deal of pressure in a lot of organizations recently. Um, I remember back in, uh, back in the early 90s, or late 90s, um, there was a, a major bank that I did some work with, and their syslog team was 20 people. So those days are gone. We, we're not going to have 20 people reading syslogs at a major bank anymore. Everyone is expected to, to take those 20 people and find something else for them to do. Um, or let's replace that with an artificial intelligence. And that's going to be another interesting topic that I'm not talking about today. Um, but it's going to get interesting when we start trying to figure out how to do that. And there's been a great deal of pressure towards moving towards off-the-shelf software, which is what cloud computing is another form of, right? Cloud computing is just pre-configured off-the-shelf software that's running on somebody else's computer. And so a lot of organizations have no in-house development capability at all anymore. And... <clears throat> There's a problem with that, which is that almost everything that you do with computers involves programming them to some degree or another. I, I, this, this is a place where I tend to, to freak managers out when I try to explain it to them, and sometimes they flat out won't believe me, but I'll try it on you, which is that editing a configuration file is programming a computer. You know, writing, writing forms that run in Oracle is programming a computer. And so I run into IT executives who say, well, we don't do any in-house software development. And I say, oh, well, absolutely you do. Everything you do is, is software development. Everything you do comes with a maintenance cost. And the way you can tell that you're doing software development is if it comes with a maintenance cost. Right? And, the, and it comes with an administration cost. Maintenance and administration go together. They, they don't, you can't separate them. 
But the, the general trend in computing is to centralize and to automate as much as possible. And that tends to have a, a great impact on security. It tends to scare us because what that means is that our, our computers that we're supposed to be watching over are moving someplace else and we don't necessarily know where that someplace else is. Okay. Does this button actually work? There we go. All right, I keep pushing it twice now. Okay, so one of the other problems that's coming along with that is that management is doing a great deal of fad chasing. It's unfortunate, but when computer security became an industry, when it became a market, a great deal of capital poured in. And so there was a lot of uh, venture-backed companies that went out and they promised the customers that they would do everything and they would do it very well and they would do it better than anyone else. Um, and so a lot of customers in good faith bought this stuff and it didn't necessarily work. And that's been a big problem. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's fascinating, you know, big, big data, big data, let's buy big data, put your stuff in big data, I apologize if there's anybody from a big data company here who's getting their feelings hurt by what I'm about to say. But the premise of big data was to put all of your stuff in this great big server and then um, something will happen. Well, let's sell you an artificial intelligence because your artificial intelligence will be able to sort through your pile of big data that we, that's on that big server that we sold you. And if this doesn't sound like a kind of a familiar story, we can just going to keep selling you stuff for a very long time. Um, and this is a big problem, right? Um, we are in this mode where we keep chasing our tail where something else is maybe going to be the thing that is finally going to work. Um, I can tell you that your next generation beyond the current generation firewall isn't going to solve any of the problems that the first generation firewalls weren't able to solve. The reason that the first generation firewalls weren't able to solve it was because they kept being asked to do infinitely complicated things. And the current generation are being asked to do infinitely complicated things. They are going to fail just about as badly. That's a that's a that's a given, I think, at this point. And the same thing with data sharing. We're going to we're going to continue to just sort of send data here and there, and we'll figure out what it means eventually. Well, actually, we're going to hope that the artificial intelligence comes along and is able to figure our data out for us. Here. Here, by the way, if you want to torture one of those AI people, because I talk to them fairly often, and they say, well, you know, AI is doing a pretty good job with unstructured data. I say, great, well, here's the problem. If you've got a terabyte of unstructured data and you give it to an artificial intelligence and you say, sort the stuff that matters from the stuff that doesn't matter, it's going to give you less than a terabyte of output. Let's say it gives you 350 gigabytes. Are you going to read those 350 gigabytes to see if they're correct? Well, if not, you, you don't actually have any data that really matters. You've just got a, a best guess, right? How do you know if it's correct? If you can't look at it, then, it doesn't, then you're basically flipping a coin and saying, I think this AI is correct or not. There's going to be some good, uh, good money in the AI thing. Um, but what's going on with computer security? is that we're getting pushed on from all sides. We're being pushed on from the top, we're being pushed on from the bottom, and we're being pushed on from the edges. Let me explain what I mean by that. From the top, we're getting crushed by cloud computing. It seems to be obvious, but, but cloud computing was the death knell of computer security, not because we were uh, not because we were afraid that all the data was going to leak, which is what most of us were complaining about. It's simply that you don't really need computer security people if you push stuff into the cloud, what you need is you need governance people. You need data governance and organization people. You need archivists, you need policy experts. That is sort of a computer security task. But you don't need a firewall administrator anymore. You don't need someone to read your syslogs because they're too big. And so the computer security industry has shifted fairly dramatically as a result of cloud computing. Um, where computer security begins to look like a split between policy governance and systems administration. And the systems administration part is simply systems administration with a security focus. The, the security administrator's job is to come along and go, did you turn off access, world access on that cloud bucket or not? Um, that, you know, that's what security is, is becoming in, in some places that you're going. Um, and the great thing about that is that the cloud will, will, will do that for organizations. I mean, I seem like I'm very depressed and negative about computer security fairly often, but I've encountered large organizations that don't even really do their backups. And when I used to think that cloud was a bad idea, I finally realized one day, you know, cloud, cloud can't possibly be worse than the way a lot of these organizations are doing things now anyway. In fact, it's, it's probably better. 
and it finds jobs for people at cloud companies. So yeah, go ahead, put all your data in the cloud. I really don't care. You know, have fun with it. It's going to be good. BYOD is an interesting fad. It, it started, and it, it got a, a great deal of traction, and then it just disappeared. There was a lot of talk about BYOD, and then suddenly there was no talk about BYOD. What happened to BYOD? Well, let me tell you what happened to BYOD. The reality of BYOD is that everybody was doing it already anyway as soon as smartphones came into existence. All that BYOD is is people bringing their smartphones from home and using your network bandwidth and trying to do work on the smartphones. I don't know anybody who doesn't have their corporate desktop or corporate laptop and they've got their smartphone on the desk right next to it and who knows what, what they're doing on what. But actually, that's not such a bad scenario. A lot of us were kind of worried about it. But the obvious answer is do your, do your dangerous stuff on your smartphone and do your important stuff on your work computer and keep them separate. And what you're actually moving towards is a kind of a dual desktop environment like some of us were talking about back in the 80s where I, you know, I would go to some of my clients and say, you should pull two sets of copper through your building and have one clean network and one dirty network and the clean network should never be connected to anything and the dirty network can be connected to everything. And that, that's really kind of what's happening. The only difference is that now the dirty network is the cellular network and it's connected to everything and the clean network, actually there is no clean network, they're both, they're all dirty networks but the corporate WAN is connected behind a firewall to the internet and, uh, and you know, so the fad doesn't really seem to have died out it just sort of became part of reality and became accepted as part of reality. But that has an interesting impact also on systems administration and security administration. I know some organizations that aren't giving people laptops anymore. Just use your iPad. Uh, so there are no laptops. If there's no laptops, there's no laptop security problems either. There's transitive trust problems because people are bringing in, are bringing in IP-enabled devices. Um, and then the worst case, which I didn't talk about um, on BYOD, is what happens if somebody brings their own Internet of Things device from home, which is a disaster because the Internet of Things, um, you, you know what the S stands for in Internet of, in IoT, right? That stands for security. Um, and if you're, you know, there is no S in IoT, right? So they left it out. Um, they'll do that later, maybe. So what's happening on the, on the, from the flanks is that we're getting pushed on by new management models. And I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen with desktops here, but I, I'm starting to see the potential that some organizations are going to you know, shift away from Microsoft or possibly shift away from desktops entirely. The walled garden software model that Apple basically built with iOS devices is very interesting and very attractive. Um, typical of Apple, they didn't think about the enterprise market at all, and so there's no way to have an enterprise walled garden for software for IoT, you know, for, uh, for iOS devices. Um, but that's where I think things are going to wind up going with some of that. The, the obvious elephant in the room there is software as a service, which is essentially a very specific form of a cloud computing environment in which somebody has built an entire infrastructure to solve a specific problem and what they'll do is solve that problem for you using your data on their machines with their software. And you think about that, what they've done is they've taken the entire administrative cost of the problem away. Your only problem, if you want to do accounting on, on this cloud, cloud software as a service, your only problem is, do you save your backups every so often? Because they're responsible for absolutely everything else. If they go chapter 11, you've got to, you'll suddenly remember that you're responsible for all that data. But that hasn't been happening very much because most of these software as a service companies are doing pretty well. So they're surviving, so your, your data is surviving. So that's all, that's all very good. So what you'll notice in the previous slides is that I've never said anything about security actually being driven by security requirements. <laughs> Which is very, that's why I started to get depressed. Security really is being driven, the whole industry is being driven by things that have nothing to do with security. It doesn't matter whether our desktops are better against malware or not. No one, no one in the decision-making layer is caring about that. They're assuming that they're getting better against malware, but the reality is that they're just looking at the top-line systems administration costs, and they're saying, do we need desktops at all? Because those, th those things cost us a lot to keep them running. All right. 
everything in, that is driving security is these two items, systems administration and configuration management. Now, configuration management and systems administration are not quite the same thing. They, they, you see them together. Configuration management is what happens when you've solved systems administration or more or less automated systems administration. That's what makes Amazon AWS what it is. That's what makes Google what Google is. Those organizations have basically solved systems administration for their specific software as a service requirements. And so they don't have that administrative cost that they have to pass on to everybody. They've solved it for everybody, then they're able to amortize it for everybody. And if you think about it, simply the cost savings alone of not having systems administrators make AWS look attractive. Right? You don't have to have somebody there who drinks a lot of coffee and comes in and changes the backup tapes. You don't, you don't need that. Um, of course, your data is on somebody else's computer, and if that bothers you, then you need to be worried about this. This is one of the reasons why I believe that the current focus on standards and compliance is, is ill-advised. I've talked to a lot of security people who have said now they're going to take us seriously, now that we've got PCI in place and we've got uh, G GDPR, and we've got all these rules that have been put in place regarding leaking data. Really? Here's the problem. If what is pushing your industry is the cost of complying with rules, the worst thing you can do is make more rules. Essentially what you're doing is you're writing rules saying you're expensive. And management is going to look at you and go, how do we reduce all of security as a problem rather than how do we become more compliant? And I'm already seeing that trend in a couple places in the US where you have organizations that are under PCI and they basically outsource, you know, their response to being put under PCI is to outsource the entire PCI problem to some software as a service outfit uh, or to some cloud outfit and say it's not our problem anymore. Of course, the end result is, is extremely confusing. So don't, don't expect me to tell you that this is all going to work out. The end result is that now you've got your data is everywhere. You still consider it your business's private data, but it's running on who knows whose computers, who knows where. The backups are being done maybe, but where they're being done and where they're being stored is not your problem. It's not, actually it's, it doesn't appear to be anybody's problem. Who knows where, where that's being done, All right? So that's, that's interesting. I think that there will be a job, a, a job description coming up in the next five to 10 years that hasn't come up yet, but it's going to be data archivist and it's going to be a sort of a data, a data librarian would be the, that, that would be what I would call myself. I would, you know, senior data librarian. And the data librarian is the person who actually knows where stuff is. Because you're going to need that. And the data librarian is, if we don't have that right now in a lot of organizations. The data librarian does not exist. People don't know where their data is. You talk to organizations, they say, we have 2,500 things that do file sharing on our internal network based on the last vulnerability scan that we did. And I, I can't even let them get past that before I'm clutching my temple and going, you do realize that vulnerability scanning is not how you should be finding your file, share, file shares, right? You should know where your file shares are. Well, that's too complicated. Huh, okay, well, you know, one of the problems is, and just to, to, to get a little bit meta on you all of a sudden, is that management is waking up to the fact that computing is more expensive than they were told it was going to be. Everybody who sold management computers said, oh, it's gonna be easy. I remember back in the 80s, people were saying, oh, you know, you don't need a systems administrator. It's, you know, it's good stuff. It's Unix, it'll just run. <laughs> And then there were, you know, office secretaries who were expected to run Unix super mini, uh, super mini systems and they couldn't understand how that uh, didn't work out very well. But so there's, there's going to be the idea of putting additional layers of management around a problem that is a fundamental lack of management. And this is going backwards. This isn't going to work. The problem is complexity. And the worst thing you can do when your problem is that things are too complicated is to add rules around it because rules are also complicated. And then you have to worry about whether your rules are correct. And, and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So we have more complex bad software in order to deal with more bad software. The obvious answer is to not have bad software, but that's a totally difficult, to totally difficult problem. I don't think we're going to solve that one in any time. But so, what, What's happening here 
And how is the industry going to change? First off, we have to stop doing this penetrate and patch thing. Just getting, I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, I remember back in 2000, I did a talk at uh, CSI in Chicago, and one of the things that I said is that soon all software is going to automatically stream patch updates down to itself. And all the security people in the room started clutching their temples and saying, that's never going to happen. And you can see how that happened. Right? It's because, because forcing people to actually do all of their configuration management is extremely painful. So we kicked the can down the road and basically made it the next generation's problem by saying we're not going to worry about writing good software. We're going to worry about getting more bad software shoveled onto your systems quicker with a minimum amount of interference. And that's why, you know, if you, use, uh, if you use apps like Yelp or something like that, you get a 35 megabyte download every 24 hours because some engineer someplace decided he was going to change something and then, poof, they push out a new version. You don't know what the changes are. Nobody knows. That has to be coupled with a more disciplined way of managing software. And we haven't invented that yet. One of the things that I imagine is this notion of version repudiation. Right, the idea is, and, and, and bless their hearts, Apple kind of sort of does some of this. Apple is willing to break things so that they won't work anymore. Or they'll take away your old version of some app and replace it with a new version of some app, and they'll basically tell you you're not allowed to run that old version of this particular app. So that's one of the things that could wind up happening, is that we'll move to an environment where software is a little bit better, and you won't be able to run software that is known to be really horrifically bad. And that would be, you know, that would be kind of interested, interesting. And we may wind up switching towards whitelisting things that we know are good and, and blocking stuff that we're not sure about. We're not even really doing that yet. And again, the cost there, the management cost is going to be the big problem. It's always the aggregated management cost. And the aggregated management cost is the cost of managing your systems, which is the part that executive management is looking at right now, because that's the big dollar budget item. That's the visible part of the problem. How, much, how many people do we need in order to keep all of our computers from falling over? How many people do we need in order to keep our network from falling over? But there are these two other ones that people are really ignoring, which is the cost of knowing what you have and where it is, which is ultimately governance and it's, it's data administration, and then the cost of governance, which is what to do with it and why. And that's the part that really scares me, is that right now, executive management in a lot of co companies are looking at the management cost as just systems administration, and they don't realize that understanding what the computing in your environment is supposed to do is really the problem. And I had a conversation a couple months ago with the chief technology officer from a, a big, important California startup. And he said, well, that stuff's really hard. It's really hard to keep track of you know, what depends on what and what depends on what depends on what. And I said, that's what the chief technology officer is supposed to do. You know, other than having a nice corner office and lots of stock options, figuring this stuff out is, is what you're supposed to do. It's understanding the dependencies in your technology stack is your job. He thought his job was to churn out a new release of an application every month. He didn't understand that the application didn't matter. It was the data for the millions of users that drove the application that mattered, and that stuff was being handled extremely casually. Uh, let's put, just put it that way. So the point to any managers in the room, and the, the point that you should make to managers when you talk to them about this stuff, is that you can squish the costs around a little bit but you're still going to wind up paying. If systems administration is too expensive for you, you can put all your stuff up in AWS. First off, you're going to pay for AWS. That's a flat out dollar cost. But still, now you have this management problem where you don't know what's in AWS. I know companies that are trying to figure out what their AWS footprint looks like by looking at the invoices that they're paying. That's it, that's it, right? Because there's no strategy, there's no central strategy at these organizations for what gets hosted in the cloud because anyone can host anything they want in the cloud. All you need is a line item in your budget. You just bury it in there. Um, and 
and now you're, you're hosting important corporate data out in the cloud. It just, it just happens, right? So managing that process, managing and encouraging that the right thing be done is a really difficult thing. Um, I can't remember the guy's name now, but there's a, there's a security guy who's made a, a pretty good career for himself by just going and trolling through world-readable AWS buckets and seeing what's in them. Because it turns out that a lot of people who are saving a lot of money by just moving their data out to AWS are, are forgetting to turn off the world-readable bit on the bucket. It's, it's not hard, right? But um, they need to think about it a little bit. They need to manage it a little bit more carefully. And that's the single highest cost item in this stack is the thing that we do worst, which is systems administration. And, and as I always tell people when they say systems administration is expensive, I say you should try having none. If, and if, if that doesn't, doesn't horrify you, try having bad systems administration. If you think your systems administrator is expensive, I know a guy who really sucks who will do it for half the price. And when you see what he'll do to your data, you'll wish you'd paid more for somebody who actually knows what they're doing. The problem here is computing is difficult. Computing is difficult. You can't do this stuff and it's, it, it, you can't do this stuff easily. If it were so easy as they say, everyone would be doing it and the crazy part is then there would be no value to doing it either. If it was really easy to set up a website and manage hundreds of millions of data records and, and build a hospital IT system, if that was easy, Everyone would be doing it, which would mean nobody would be willing to pay for it, right? So the fact that it's not good means that it's, it's a kind of a benefit for you. I guess I'm saying, unfortunately, we're, we're part of the problem, but we may as well profit on being part of the problem. Um, I've got a few slides that I added here that I'm not going to get to probably, but anyway. So configuration management is systems administration. That's the part that we need to think about. We need to professionalize our configuration processes inside of our organizations. If you're able to professionalize systems administration, then you can do like Google and AWS. And if you can't, then move your data to Google and AWS because that's where it's going to wind up anyway. Right? So, so configuration management, the process of automating and dealing with your systems and how they are run, it em embraces all of these things. And I just turned it off. How did I do that? Okay, good. Um, it embrace, embraces everything from system recovery to malware detection to backup and restore, and privilege management, user management, and license management. All of these things get rolled up inside of systems administration. And I know way too many organizations that look at these problems here and they use something like Microsoft SCCM. And what they do is they use SCCM to field a copy of Windows onto a user's system and then they go, here it is, screw it up and they never look at it again. The user does whatever they want to with that system, including you know, getting lots and lots of malware and stuff like that. Um, if, you, if your model for using configuration management tools is to use them just to get your system up and running and not to keep it up and running, then I submit to you that you're using it half, halfway or less than halfway. You're getting less than half of the benefit out of the tool because you should be using it to keep things running. It's like buying a car, do, not doing your configuration management for your systems is like buying a car and then never changing the oil. Uh, you wind up buying a new car every couple of years um, and it doesn't save you any money if what you're trying to do is, is save money on your cars. All right, I've already po pointed this out. It's easy to put your data into AWS. The question is, do you know how to put your data into AWS and do you know how to manage your data once you have put it into AWS? Uh, I, I was involved in an incident response earlier this summer uh, with an organization, you may have read about this on the front page of the news, but um, this organization spent probably $13 million because their systems administrator was too lazy to turn off access from his home systems. Um, and that was a big problem. And then there's a lot of organizations that are still trying to do forensic network discovery. They're just trying to figure out what they have on their network because their idea all through the 90s was let's just build as big a network as we possibly can and we'll put all these computers on it. And, and then you start asking, what does this system do? I don't know. Well, what do any of your systems do? We don't know. What we do when we need to know what a system does is we trace it down and we figure out who owns it. And then we ask them, what does that system do? Now, you don't have a network. 
You've got an internet full of systems you know nothing whatsoever about if that's, if that's the kind of network that you're talking about. It's the governance cost. The reason I wanted to raise this point is that a lot of organizations want to move towards software-defined networking, liquid networking, that kind of thing. And in order to get the performance benefits of software-defined networking, you have to know where the data is going to go. So the whole idea of SDN is that you can move data from the edge of your network to critical systems inside, and you can so use software to control the size and reliability of the bandwidth that's going through to those systems. It's pretty cool. But in order to control and make the data go quickly from here to there, you have to know where there is. You have to know what there is. You have to know what the endpoints are that you're going to be sending this data to. Because otherwise, you're like that guy in This Is Spinal Tap who's turning the bandwidth on everything up to 11, which means that everything has the same bandwidth. You can't do that. And so that's going to be a big problem. Organizations that are still running around trying to figure out what they have on their network by just mapping it are going to be unable to take advantage of software-defined networking because if you don't have a map, you're not able to, you know, figure, you can't figure out where the borders are if you don't even have a map. It, do, it doesn't make any sense. So if you're going to talk to management about this stuff, use small words. Now, these are a couple of slides I didn't think I was going to get to, and I'm not, but I wanted to throw in a plug for, use, for, for metrics. One of the other things that security practitioners don't do a very good job of is talking to executive management. Other than just shouting at them, the, only, the best way to get their attention is to explain using some kind of metrics, what it is that you do. Where does the money go? Where do the resources go? What does your security team do? What are your accomplishments? What are your inputs? And what are your outputs? And the easy way to build a metric, there's a lot more than, than this than I can get into, but the easy way to build a metric is to figure out what all of your inputs are. What are the things that put stuff on your agenda for things that your security practice has to do? What are the internal transitions that that information goes through? Once something gets put on your plate, what happens to it? Build a list of all the things that happen to it. And then the outputs. What happens to the stuff on the inside? How do you get it off your plate? And what does that look like? And then measure the rate that things go in the inputs, where they come from, where they go to. And you'll get some idea of what it is that you're actually doing. And this is the governance part of security again, right? So you're trying to say, we did this, it resulted in, what, in that. We did this many things, we did that many outputs. So if your security team is doing a certain amount, let's say they're doing a certain amount of incident response, and someone proposes to, to double the size of the company, but not double the size of the security team, you can say, we're going to need to improve our practices over here, because if you double our inputs, we're not going to be able to handle that, because our, our throughput just simply isn't there. Right? So you have to help them understand where the effort is going and where the output is going. Um, this is one that I, I don't see, which is organizations aren't thinking about moving to Max, which is a little bit odd. Um, another thing that's interesting is a lot of organizations assume that software is going to be there for too long. I would do this as a joke and say, how many of you in this room have fallen in love with a piece of software and purchased it and then seen it go out of production five years later? Has that ever happened to anybody? Right? It happens all the time. And so what you have to do is you have to plan as part of your software deployment life cycle, plan on the idea that that piece of software that you just put all that effort into buying and configuring is going to go away. So part of the message here is don't fall in love with software. Unless you wrote it, in which case fall way in love with it, but it's going to be like an albatross around your neck. But don't fall in love with someone else's software because you never know when it's going to get bought by somebody and screwed up. Or it may just cease to function or there'll be something better. So um, start to maintain metrics. The best time to start doing that is now because it's going to take you at least a year to be able to build some performance metrics over time to see where your actual effort is going. Um, Right? The, the joke about is, when is the best time to plant a mighty oak tree? Well, 50 years ago would be the best time to have planted a mighty oak tree. When is the second best time to plant a mighty oak tree? Right now. Right? So we can't go back in time and build ourselves metrics programs five years ago, but if we start building them now, in two years when we wish we could explain things to management, you may actually have a better idea. So everything I'm saying, saying here is really just ignorance is expensive. And I think we, we're being too ignorant about what we're doing in IT, and we're, we're really not looking enough at how to automate things. 
automating things, the focus on management and automation is where we should be. And if you want to have a good career in IT, that's where you want to be, because otherwise you're the thing that's going to be getting managed out. Um, and so that's really it. If you're working in software, you're screwed. Um, Avoid any kind of forensic management careers where what you're doing is you're managing stuff that somebody else is making worse, right? You don't have any control over other people that are making things worse. Be, these forensic management jobs where you're dealing with problems that someone else is creating is like being a sewage, a sewage function or a sewage plumber. I'm not saying that it's not a good job because it's, a, it's an ongoing career and, and there's never going to not be a need for sewage plumbers. It's just you, you never have any control over what you're going to be dealing with and it's always just going to be endlessly ugly um, and people will always wish that things would go away, right? So um, here's some places where there's going to be a lot of money in the future. It's going to be application whitelisting, storage management, not storage volume, storage management, figuring out what people have. That job I've talked about, about data librarian, you could just go to some company and say, I'll be your data archivist for you and I will figure this stuff out. So anything that manages anything for a service, that's going to be an interesting place to go. So I'm big on configuration management. The reason why is because security is a sub-discipline of systems administration. We're, we're a field, yes, as I'm not trying to dismiss security, but we're a sub-discipline of a much larger field. So with that comment, um, uh, yeah, we, we exist because they're worse, than, worse at what we do than, 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 they, than we are. And with that comment, I can try to field a couple of questions if anybody's got quick ones. Otherwise, I will slink off and enjoy my jet lag. No? All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and your attention. I hope I wasn't too depressing. I always worry about that because I see, I see this all as depressing. I've been talking for a long time about that, that there's a freight train coming, and I finally realized that the front of the freight, freight train says systems administration on it, which is a, a, a very strange thing to write on the front of a freight train. Um, but that's, that's, what, that's what it says. All right, so thank you so much for your time.